I'm not sure how many of you guys can relate to this. I was really good at something when I was a kid and even in my 20s. But then now, as a 52-year-old, I suck at it. And I did finance in college. And if someone asked me about a 1031 or something else business-related, I always go to Jade. Jade, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Amit? Good, good. So like when we do these sessions, I learn as much as you guys learn. So um, let's talk about that in Miami. So can you tell us um, why we're talking about the 1031, why it's hot, why it's a hot topic and stuff like that? Yeah, so 1031 recently, well, it's always kind of been a, a um, uh, an interesting advantage for real estate investors, but um, over the past couple months, it's gotten a lot of attention because um, because the Biden administration, and this is not political, this is just something you know that they have um, submitted. Our team isn't really one way or another. We just kind of go by the person and um, you know not to get political, but they have submitted um, to take away the 1031 exchange um, over properties of 500,000, I, uh, I believe. Um, that's what I've read. I'm not 100% sure if that will happen or anything like that, but that it has been um, a hot topic over the past couple months. And some real estate investors are scared that this benefit may go away uh, and that um, is causing them to want to want to you know, do a 1031 exchange you know, while they can, so to speak. Yeah, it, it's funny when you mentioned that. It's like with everything, like when they were going to have that, I guess, mansion tax in New York and other parts, and stuff like that. People, when they see something, it's almost like if an ice cream store is gonna, you know it's gonna close, you're gonna eat as much ice cream before you can, before it yeah. closes. So what Jade is saying, we definitely are getting a lot of people that are, I guess, scared about that. And with politics, we never know what's gonna happen. You know, Things change all the time, but, and it depends when you see this. Today is, let's see what the date is, it's June, June 15th, 2021. And sometimes we'll, people will see our videos like years later. So that's when it is. So, so like pretend someone knows nothing about a 1031. And so like, we'll, I'm gonna ask you a question like I'm an investor and then we'll go through that process if that's okay. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, it works for me a little bit because I have a, a townhouse that I'm probably gonna put in the market in a few months. I. I've been renting it for a while and um, the market is hot for a seller. You know, you're going to put it on the market because last year, so I bought this townhouse in 2002, bought it pre-construction. I bought it for 169. Last year, th there were some that sold for 325. They just put one on the market for 425 and it's pending, you know, so the market is really hot. So like for others that have investments, and that are going to sell their property. Tell us how, how the process is and how it goes. Sorry, if you hear the noise, that's just because I live under a flight path. You know, you know we can't hear anything, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so well, I can hear. So 1031, is, an 1031 exchange, just to kind of give the basic overview, um, it's a part of the, you know, the revenue code, the IRS, and it comes from section 1031, hence the name. Um, and it's basically a way to defer your capital gains tax um, on a property. And you, you technically defer the tax. And essentially, you're the goal would be to defer it over and over and over again, until you pass away or hold the property until you pass away. And then it's forgiven. By the government so it's a, a way and again we're not tax attorneys or anything but it's a way to essentially not pay capital gains tax on on your um investment property um so, there are a couple rules and everything but we'll get into that yeah so it makes me think when you talk about that sort of like a 401k like mm -hmm. if someone they're deferring their taxes I, yeah. I guess the difference would be the 401k 401k eventually you'll pay the taxes yeah exactly like the roth versus the regular yeah right um, so basically you, you avoid paying those capital gains. And again, capital gains would be, let's say you purchase a property for an investment property for 500,000, right? And then a couple of years down the road, uh, you sell it for a million. So on that $500,000 difference, you would pay a capital gains tax to the government. Uh, and that rate is gonna depend on your income level. Um, so, 
it could be zero if you make a certain, uh, if you're under 40,000, I believe, 0% capital gains, but most investors who have that kind of property would be in the higher tax bracket. Um, so from 40,000, I think it's 240, 248. Um, it's a 15% capital gains. And then um, above that, above the 248, 300 or something, it's 20%. Um, so essentially on that $500,000 gain, um, you could save that 20% um, tax rate. And is there like, so you have to buy another property? Is that what you have to do? Yes. Yeah, so there's a whole timeline and the timeline is not forgivable. You can't break the timeline in any way. There's no way to around it. Um, and you have to make sure you follow all the steps, right? If you're, if you're going to not pay or defer um, the, the percentage to the government, then you have to basically follow their rules. Um, so the whole process um, is that you sell your current property, right? So you put um, that property under contract within 45 days of selling that property, you have to identify another property that's equal or more value. And it could be, there are different, I'll get into that in a second, but there are different ways you could do it. It doesn't have to be one property. Um, it, there are three different sections on how to do it, but basically um, the cumulative value has to be equal to or more than the one you're selling. So if you sell in this example for a million, then you have to, take a million and put it back, you know, either one property or according to whichever form you want to do it. Um, so that's within 45 days, you have to identify that second, um, you know, investment that you're going to switch it to. Um, so I have a question for you. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. So I have two questions. Um, one is, um, what does identify me? Find, right? So find and, and go under contract. Okay. So be... Yeah. Yeah, a little bit now. So basically, you have to be you have to have a pending offer um, within 45 days. Yeah. So within that 45 day window, you have to find and be uh, under under contract. But you don't have to close until the hundred until six months, which I think is what 180 days. Right? Yeah. Uh, so but that 180 days is not after the 45. It's in, the 45 is included. Right. Okay. So like, uh, one of the, the questions I have is like, if you sold that other one for a, for a million and you find one, I mean, it's probably difficult to find exactly another one for a million. Say you find one for 1.5 million, then what happens? Then that's fine. It just has to be equal or more value. Okay. So it could be anything over a million. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And you said you, you need to do that in 45 days. You have to close within 180 days. And um, could it be residential or commercial? Does it does it vary or? This has to be like kind, and it has to be an investment property. So, um, people, you don't do it on your primary residence because there's another claim. Uh, because there is a um, different section of the IRS code uh, that I think it's 1034. If I'm not mistaken. Um, where you wouldn't have to pay capital gains on your primary residence. So you would do it on an investment property and it can be residential, commercial. They say it has to be like kind, which basically just means it has to be real estate. So it doesn't have to be, if you're selling a multifamily, it doesn't have to be a multifamily. It could be a warehouse. Um, they really just care about the value of it. Okay, so like, for example, if someone had a condo, they were renting it out, mm -hmm. they sold it for a million. Yeah. Then they, again, with the ice cream shops, they find an ice cream shop, 1.5 million and they buy it as an investment would that be possible yeah yeah okay. as long as they're buying obviously the real estate not just the right uh, okay yeah. okay what are some of the other things that people ask you about this um well people always ask about the primary residence thing um when and and i say it's not you know you don't do really 1031 in your primary residence um, you don't need to, but there are other specifications for the 1034. Like you have to live in that property for two years. So I had a client from Arizona who wanted to move to Miami, but he didn't want to pay the capital gains on his primary residence. But in order to avoid that, he had to stay there an extra year because he just bought it and it went up so much in value so quickly. Um, and the only way to get around that was to say there, there's no way to to get around the two years since it was his primary residence and he was moving his primary residence, but that's not really 1031, that's something else. But right. uh, people do ask that question about the primary residence. They also ask if it has to be the same, you know, type of real estate. 
Um, I wanted to go back to that primary residence thing. Yeah. And so for you guys that don't know, Jade was referring to, if you, if you live in a home, it's your primary residence and you live in it two out of five years, you can, you, if you're, if it's just one owner, you can deduct 125, no, 250,000 of the capital gains. And if you're, if it's a joint, if there are two people on the title, I, I guess I'm not sure if it's husband or wife or husband and husband, wife, whatever it is. Um, if there are two people, you could deduct up to 500,000 of capital gains. Is that correct? Yeah, yep, 250 and then 500 for, for married. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, and what get I married, no. <laughs> Um, what happens um, if you're a foreigner? Uh, yeah, I was just looking at my notes. Oh, go on. I'm sorry. Um, so if you're a foreigner for a 1031 exchange? Yeah. Uh, that's funny because I actually had this question two weeks ago and we were trying to figure out, um, can you sell a property and do a 1031 on a property from outside of the United States and then purchase a property in the United States and avoid the, the capital gains. Um, and it didn't work. Uh, basically that, that was, you can do it, um, but one of the properties can't be in the United States. So when you're doing the 1031, um, it's typically state to state or interstate, but for instance, he was from Argentina, so he couldn't sell his property in Argentina and then buy in the United States and avoid the capital gains on that. But what he could do is if he were um, buying a property in two separate countries that are not the United States, avoid the capital gains there if he was a U.S. citizen. Oh, okay. Okay. So, 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 if, so you, since you're an American citizen, if you bought a property in Brazil and you sold it in um, India, you could probably, and yeah. obviously we're not tax, you know, we're not tax experts, but probably something like that, there's a possibility that would be the case. Yeah, you just can't exchange a foreign property for a U.S. property or a U.S. for a foreign, but if it's two separate, um, you know, two foreign countries, then you can. If okay. you're trying to figure out how to avoid the, because the capital gains in Argentina is crazy, so um, that's what we were talking about. Right, so what, what else do people ask you about 1031s, or what else would you like to share about them? Um, there was, uh, people have asked if they can touch the money after, right? So when they're like in the process of it, um, I don't know if you remember the, I won't say their name, but the people, yeah, from, yeah okay, the tech guy, um, they had they had to keep calling their QI, their qualified intermediary, which is like the person that kind of manages the 1031 um, and make sure, you know, see what day they were allowed to move the funds and not because if you take money, out of the escrow account that holds the 1031 money. Um, it's considered boot, I think they call it boot. And then you have to, once you touch it, you have to pay the tax on it. So even if you're trying to do the 1031 exchange and you take like a little bit, $5 or whatever, you, yeah, you have to pay, you have to pay tax on it. So it's just off limits completely. Yeah, you can't, it just doesn't, doesn't exist in your pocket basically. Okay, so, um, so, so like, Let's go through the process. I know you ex shared with us a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so let's give this example, like me with the townhouse. So say I sell the townhouse, right? Yeah. And say I sell it for 500,000. Okay. You're my agent. What is the next thing I do? Once I get the proceeds of it, do I have to put it a certain place or what do I do with it? Yeah, so that what I was saying is uh, like the client, um, we have to identify and get a qualified intermediary. So they are gonna be the ones in charge of managing the, the 1031 exchange, actually not an agent. Um, so, so is that like an accountant? Is it a financial advisor? Who would be that? Uh, a qualified intermediary? It's a, it's a great question. Why don't I just look at my, look at my notes here? All right. Uh, yeah, sorry to ask all the questions, but you can tell I don't know the answers. And if you don't know, it's okay. One of the great things about, um, I think, about our team is we, we hire people that, or we have relationships with people that know more than us about certain things. And we know the right people to, to you know, send them to. This is interesting. I didn't know this. So it says CPAs, attorneys, investment bankers, and real estate agent and brokers 
uh, cannot act as your qualified intermediary. Oh, I mean, wow. I the agent part, but I didn't, I would assume, I was gonna assume maybe an attorney. Right. Uh, so that's very interesting. Okay, but either way, if you guys end up um, calling Jade or myself for a 1031, we have, we definitely have a lot of people that we could send you to. Um, and we usually give you more than one um, recommendation. Yeah. So, um, okay, so, so then we find this, it's a QI, you said, right? Or, or is, intermediary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you can tell this the first time I heard that word before. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so the, the QI has the funds or whatever, I guess is in charge of the funds, maybe. Yep. yep. Then we find a property, say we find a property in 35 days, we're under contract, um, we have to close within six months, yep. then what else happens? Anything else? So, yeah, after you find the property, you send a letter to the QI, like a duty letter, um, I, you know, saying that you found the property and, and, um, and this is what you're going to you know, purchase, and then you're going to negotiate on, or well, now you can't really negotiate, but mm -hmm. then you're going to get into contract and, uh, with the new property. Um, and, uh, you're going to have that QI, um, they're going to transfer the, your capital gains tax that they're holding. Right. Um, cause essentially you're, you're sending the, the capital gains to the QI, the qualified intermediary, they're going to, um, send that to the title holder to, so to whoever is, um, is doing your transaction. Yeah, so while you're saying this, I'm thinking like, if I'm a buyer and I identify my property within, you know, 45 days, closing within six months should be pretty easy unless it's commercial or it's pre-construction or something like that. If, yeah. Uh, yeah, go on. No, no, yeah, I think so. The only thing is, um, depending on what it is, right? Um, a lot of times on multifamily and stuff, you want to see their their rent roll, and you kind of want to go into um, a couple of uh, you know in depth in, in terms of the numbers there, and maybe you want to go visit it, or if you're going to be building something, you want to do soil tests and stuff like that, um, and those can run like you know 45 days to a couple months. Um, yeah. So with that said, like. like yeah, another thing is like if it's residential and especially in our market, a lot of times the sellers aren't as ready to move as quickly as the buyers, right? The buyers yeah. need places and the sellers need more time. So yeah. I would recommend, and there are probably a bunch of different things you can do, but if you're getting to a point where you're, your closing date is right around six months, you have to close. I'm not sure if it's 180 or six months, but either way, you got to make sure you close before then, because if you don't, you're going to lose all that tax advantage. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's 180. I'm saying six months, but it's 100. Yeah. So okay. So at the 180 days, if you have a contract and it's going to close close to that time period, you got to be cognizant of the fact that if the seller is delaying it and delaying it, maybe you allow them to delay it, but charge them that 20% on the money. I mean, you can't you can't take the chance of losing that, that tax savings because they wanted to spend another day in the house over the 180 days. Because that could be a huge liability for Yeah, you. because they're not flexible with the schedule. I mean, it's the IRS. So um, you have to close on or before the 180 days or else you have to pay when you file your, your taxes. Yeah, it's something to definitely, um, definitely be aware of. And I'm sure the QI would probably give you timelines and all that and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's their job. I mean, they get paid for it. <laughs> um, so I'm actually working with a client right now who's doing a 1031. Um, she's in Atlanta and, um, is looking, it's actually going to be a property that she just rents out, um, here. She actually wants something on the, on the beach, but she today just entered her 45 day, um, her 45 day window. So she she she's under contract or she passed it she just sold the the property in atlanta right so okay. 45 day now we have to identify the property. oh okay she's on her day one i guess day, yeah day one essentially okay. yeah okay cool that's exciting a little bit right as an agent and as the buyer i mean it's a little bit of pressure it's a, it's a little pressure especially in this market especially with her taste because um she is looking for something very specific 
um, and wanted to be on the ocean. And as you know, here in Miami, it's very hard to find good ROI on rental income uh, that's on the sand. Right. You know, I always tell people to try to come on the, you know, the mainland, the downtown city area, if they want better rates. But um, you know, that's what she wants. So yeah, I, I think when you talk about that, I think like, I think real estate sometimes in Miami is sort of like owning a sports team. So like, I'll give you an example. We can find higher ROIs on real estate in many, many other areas of the country, right? But what, what they're not going to find a lot of times is the appreciation for the long term on the property. So like with, with that buyer, even if she's forced to get a property in a quicker time, I mean, because she's in a time crunch with a lower ROI, as long as it makes long term sense for appreciation, then it makes sense, right? Because you're saving that that 20% on the taxes, it's getting deferred, and you're getting that appreciation on the property. So it's, you know, I, I would say like for those of you that are, are, are worried that you're not going to get into that 45 days with the right ROI, it's okay because things will work out in other ways. Yeah. I mean, you might capture appreciation, like you're saying. So. Yeah. And the sports team, the reason I brought up the sports team is many times people like buy these people that buy sports teams won't make that much each year or they'll lose money. But when they sell it, it's exponential growth. Yeah. Um, anything else about um, 1031 exchanges? Not really. That's basically, that's basically it. Okay, cool. So like if any of you guys have any questions or comments, please um, put them down. Um, we're, obviously you see that our content is on it's a podcast, it's a video, it's a blog, it's on everything. But Jade, if they need to get in touch with you, um, what is the easiest way? Uh, I think the easiest way, last week I said email. I mean, I said phone. And then this week I've had so many calls um, from different uh, numbers and stuff. So I don't know if there's something in the air, but I'm going to go with email um, or uh, Instagram. Uh, just direct message me on Instagram. That's probably the easiest place because I'm on there scrolling pretty frequently. Uh, and my Instagram is at Jade Kalbacher. So my first name, J-A-G-E, and then Kalbacher, K-A-L-B-A-C-H-E-R. Awesome. And if you've never seen Jade's stories, you'll feel like you're watching one of these million dollar listing shows, but with more highs and lows, right? Because you keep it real. <laughs> A couple of those, a couple of those thrown in there every once in a while. I met today with these new clients um, and, you know, you try to filter people as, as much as you can, but at the end of the day, you don't know. I mean, it was the proof, is the proof of funds real? Is there are certain things, I mean, you can call the bank, but who knows if, if they have someone there um, and uh it could be total hit or miss. So, but you have to swing, I guess. So we'll, we'll see. They want to see some big stuff. I have no idea if they're like for real or not. I mean, right. I, I looked them up. I'm a pretty good investigator, but I don't know. Worst case scenario, I'll learn a lot more about the market. So. Yeah. It, it's funny. Like a lot of people see these shows on TV and like one of our articles that we have on our, our website, it's like, um, like the truth and lies, I guess, about million dollar listings. Um, we get like a few hundred views every month and it shows that everyone is interested in what the real truth is. And it's quite different than what we see on TV. Wait, a few hundred or a few hundred thousand? No, we get like a few hundred views like each month on this oh, article that month, was- month. I'm like, wait, wait, what? Because I, I know the numbers for the all the- the TV show are very high. No, um, no, like for the, I, I wrote an article a few years ago on like the, I guess what's actually true on million dollar listing. And we get a few hundred views every month on that from yeah. all over the world. It's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah. Um, there's a lot they don't tell you, so. Yeah. So um, I guess we, we tried to make 1031 exchanges as um, entertaining yeah. as possible. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, what's more entertaining than saving 20% if you make $248,000 a year, right? Yeah, that's definitely true. And guys, when you hear this, if there's ever a topic 
or education or anything you want us to um, discuss, please let us know. We'll be happy to do that. So until next time, thanks for joining us. Bye.